Good afternoon. I want to thank Shimon for inviting me to join him and allowing me to give a first-hand account of our point of view on the issue of endodontic outcomes. I'd like to start this presentation with this slide from Bertrand Russell because I believe this comment epitomizes the problem we have in endodontics in that we don't actually know what we think we know. And we would be well served by having less confidence in those things that we feel we are certain of. I believe it is a truth that you can never be harmed by being told the truth. It isn't the truth that hurts. It's the judgment. It's not the truth. It's the judgment that one may be thought less well of because of the truth. So as we do an assessment of our outcomes research, let's just focus on the truth and avoid any judgment about it. I want to completely avoid the impression that I know the truth. I'm just like everyone else here. I'm searching for some evidence that can help me become a better clinician. So please accept my apologies if I come across as knowing the truth. I don't. Indeed, I may be very well wrong in my emphasis today. It certainly wouldn't be the first time. Let's just spend the next 50 minutes today reasoning together, and I'll give you my reasons for why I think like I do. Part of my truth is that I think I have a pretty good idea of what isn't true. So in a way, that's a kind of truth in itself. So before we start, I'd like you to consider a few things. Number one, are we sure that we have defined our specialty correctly? I will try to make the point that we have inappropriately defined our specialty in such a way that it almost guarantees poor clinical decision making. Number two, are we studying and measuring the right outcomes in the right way and at the appropriate time frames? I believe our current definition confuses a surrogate outcome, radiographic clearing, for the actual outcome we desire, which is tooth survival. We mistake one for the other or even think they are the same thing, and I will attempt to show that they are not. Number three, is our clinical confidence justified by our outcome evidence? I will maintain that we have a body of literature, mostly from retrospective observational studies, that misinforms us, giving us a level of confidence that is completely unwarranted, using an evidential base that is weak and cannot withstand careful scrutiny. This overconfidence in us leads us into very poor treatment decisions, causing us to make many amateurish errors and harms the specialty's credibility when these errors become obvious to the wider dental profession. This almost universal overconfidence damages our credibility as professionals and our credibility as a specialty. And in the end, if I haven't been booted out of the room, I'd like to give some suggestions on how we might move our specialty forward toward a more evidence-based approach by adopting better study designs and statistical methodologies. The current definition refers to the goal of endodontics as being one to prevent apical periodontis or cure it if we can. I'm okay with number one. If we can prevent it from ever occurring, we should definitely do that. I'm not so sure about number two. I don't see my goal as one that eliminates or cures apical periodontis, er, apical periodontitis. My goal is to treat a chronic disease in such a way that the patient is able to maintain their dentition for as long as possible. I may infer that I eliminate apical periodontist in the process. I am sure many times I don't. In any event, I don't confuse those two things with each other, and my professional vision is clear. Do what is necessary to preserve the tooth over the long term and avoid doing unnecessary things that can weaken the tooth in a misguided attempt to cure apical periodontitis. Some of these unnecessary things may involve treating apical periodontitis when it is not actually an imperative to, thereby exposing the patient to risks that far exceed the imagined benefit. My goal is for you to appreciate that this end goal is completely different 
than seeing our role as clinicians who treat or cure apical periodontitis. I'm not going to talk about outcomes on vital teeth today or even primary endodontic treatment. During my presentation, I'm going to consider only teeth that have already had endodontic treatment because that is where we are tested the most and where our understanding of our purpose and goals is truly revealed. When talking about outcomes, outcomes, what is it that we actually want to know? Is it the same thing that our patients want to know or is it different? Let's imagine that this case walks into your office next Monday. Here we have a suggestion of disease, perhaps some questions about the coronal restoration, but a tooth that has been asymptomatic for almost 20 years. For many endodontists, this is a slam dunk, requires little thinking, and the decision-making seems straightforward. Our job is to treat apical periodontitis, not observe it get worse, right? Hand me my headstrums, please. But what does the patient want to know? Don't they want to know the risk of this actually getting worse? Does worse mean an area slowly increasing in size with no symptoms over the next 20 year period? Or does worse mean a swollen face on New Year's Eve? If they have disease, don't they want to know how serious that disease is? Shouldn't we try to distinguish disease from disease that matters if we can? I mean, we all live with minor diseases of some sort, don't we? Most of you have bladder infections, but you don't know it and probably never will be aware of it. The men here who are 65 or older probably have prostate cancer, but you're very unlikely to die from it. So I don't re recommend you run out and have it treated right now unless you have symptoms. The fact is we all live with chronic diseases that require no treatment and in fact, usually require no treatment. To repeat, if this patient has had disease for 20 years, don't they want to know the probability of this tooth ever becoming symptomatic? Furthermore, what is the risk of delaying retreatment until it does become symptomatic? What is the risk of doing retreatment now? What can go wrong? Could the retreatment be successful, yet the tooth breaks because of the retreatment? What are the risks of that? What is the risk of the tooth requiring endodontic surgery subsequent to retreatment? Does that ever happen? And how frequently does it happen? I could go on like this forever. The point is, do any of you know with any certainty what these risks actually are? Shouldn't our outcome studies inform us of these risks so we can better inform our patients? So let's start with what we call disease. Since we can't understand outcomes unless we know what we are measuring, shouldn't we develop an understanding of what disease is and whether a patient actually has a disease that truly requires timely intervention? In this understanding, we should also consider not only what disease is, but whether our interventions affect the disease in a way that is important for patients balanced against the risks the patients take in accepting our interventions. Many times endodontists are oblivious that their treatments actually make patients worse or cause their patients to lose their tooth sooner than had nothing been done. Using prostate cancer as an example, 90% of men with prostate cancer die without ever knowing they have it. They have disease, but they have disease that doesn't matter a term we will come back to. If all men who had the disease could be made aware of it, 10% might benefit from treatment. 90% would regret it or realize they had it treated unnecessarily. There is no sophisticated understanding of disease without balancing the risks and benefits of treating against the risks and benefit of just observing. First, I'd like to make a few comments about our disease model in endodontics. Our notion comes from Koch's germ theory of disease, doesn't it? Let's consider whether this model is a helpful model for us in endodontics. In questioning the validity of the theory, because it is a theory after all, it all starts with Bill Costerton and the radical change that occurred in our understanding of our disease model. And because of this man, who I had the good fortune to know well and work with, and together with Garth Ehrlich, 
made it possible to understand the great disconnect between what we thought our disease model was and what we observed clinically. Any understanding of endodontic outcomes is impossible to comprehend without first understanding the revolution these men brought to us. So I'm going to give a short overview of what I consider the salient points. If you're not familiar with this material, you're going to disagree with much of what I have to say. What Dr. Kosterton and Ehrlich provided for us was a deeper understanding of how acute disease and chronic disease are so completely different and that the notions of disease we take from Robert Koch simply don't apply to biofilm diseases. Bacteria are not actually clonal, as Koch maintained, and biofilm diseases act totally differently from acute, single-organism, planktonic, infectious diseases. Koch's theory of disease isn't applicable for us because it is impossible to precisely duplicate all the variables involved in disease causation. We simply can't address all the naturally occurring environmental, nutritional, genetic, and other factors involved in disease expression. And we find it hard to consider all the pathogenic complexities involved when there is a sequential infection with multiple microorganisms, which is completely different from the kind of infectious diseases Robert Koch was dealing with. Here are just two snippets from our biofilm conference that will give you some sense of the revolution that these men brought. What I really want to stress today is that there is a fundamental difference um, between acute infections and chronic infections, um, and Koch's postulates don't apply to chronic infections. So there is this very important dichotomy between chronic and acute infections. And you'll see me over and over again in the talk today, I'll be referring to some of our work where we study middle ear disease or otitis media. And this is a, a very useful um, dichotomous model um, because there, are, there is an acute form of otitis media and a chronic form of otitis media. And recently I have learned from talking with uh, Gary and his colleagues that this is not unlike uh, what you see in dentistry, that you also have this dichotomy of acute and, and chronic disease. And his, his point about uh, starvation and biofilms is absolutely classic because that's one of the reasons that biofilms formed in the first case was that biofilms are resistant to drying, which is really important in marine environments. And what happens in a biofilm is if one bug dies, then its guts just to first disperse over, and the next bug soak it all up and usually divide. So biofilms are immortal. I can keep a biofilm in the lab for a couple of weeks and say, oh, got to feed my biofilms and give them a little dash of, of whatever and leave them for another month. That's exactly what biofilms do. They don't starve. And we're now using biofilms as barriers in engineering. We're placing huge biofilms in sand and, and the subsurface in soils and so on. And we have to feed them about once every 163 years by our calculation, Gary. <laughs> so your, uh, your argument is a slam dunk. Uh, nutrients have got nothing to do with a biofilm once it's formed. They've got a lot to do with how big a biofilm gets formed. But once it's formed, once the biofilm is formed, they have nothing to do uh, about feeding the organisms. Biofilm diseases, especially endodontic biofilm diseases, have completely different genotypes, phenotypes, and are almost always polymicrobial and polyclonal, displaying both genetic heterogeneity and genomic plasticity. Believers in Koch's germ theory of disease fail to consider the other phases of the bacterial life cycle, the attachment, the biofilm, the dispersal, the latency, and the dormant phases, and fail to understand that the planktonic genotype and phenotype of Cockian acute disease bears very little similarity to the genotypes and phenotypes and behaviors of chronic biofilm bacteria. So these are completely different disease models. One is simple, the other one very complex. 
A key point that can help you make a breakthrough is to understand that bacterial communities in a biofilm, when they encounter a hostile environment, a hostile environment, have a life cycle that allows them to downregulate or revert to a state of dormancy that makes them as appear as though they are dead, but they are not. Indeed, there is a theory that when considering the life cycle of bacteria, the default state of 99% of bacteria on this earth is dormancy, the default state. Consider what that means. It means that biofilm bacteria are essentially immortal when they are in the dormant state. This is one reason why 99% of bacteria on earth cannot be cultured. They multiply only when it is safe for them to do so, and they have extremely sophisticated signaling systems that inform them of when it is safe to do so. So dormancy appears to be a microbial strategy for long-term survival. All the bacteria that you miss in that MB2 that you didn't find didn't die, and it is a mistake for you to assume they did die. They just became dormant. There are bacterial communities in the Atacama Desert that have been dormant for 200,000 years, alive but dormant, just waiting for some rain. Many microorganisms in the Earth's crust have a division rate of once every thousand years. Actually, if you think about it, that's what bacteria excel at, waiting and playing possum. Those of us with retreatment practices have suspected this for years. The fact is, biofilm bacteria are essentially immortal once they are in a hostile environment. This is hard for endodontists to understand because the Koch model has blocked us from understanding it. Indeed, the entire concept of what chronic microbial disease is has been turned on its head and now we realize that chronic microbial disease is a different category of disease than acute microbial disease, and that we need to distinguish between disease and disease that matters. Making this distinction is hard for endodontists, given their historical disease model. With Robert Koch, you either had a disease or you don't. You either have anthrax or you don't. You either have an infection with a pathogen or you don't. It's very interesting, he had no explanation for typhoid Mary, a person who was infected and was carrying the organisms, but didn't have the disease. Just as Koch's advocates today in endodontics can't explain the millions of maxillary molars that are successful with missed MB2s that must be teeming with trillions of bacteria. So how do we define disease that matters? Disease that matters is when host damage is significant enough to affect quality of life or functional use of the tooth, or when we can predict with high certainty that it will at some point in the future. Notice I didn't say disease that matters is where we have an apical radiolucency. Another breakthrough is to realize that disease that matters is only one of several possible outcomes between a biofilm community and a host, and it is time dependent. So microbial chronic disease is a relative term, and disease that matters relates to the degree of host damage that results from the interaction. If there is minimal damage, the condition may re be referred to as simply a kind of temporary benign commensalism, a kind of peace in our time kind of relationship. So our definition of disease could be described as moving from a colonization or commensalism to pathogenesis, where pathogenesis is defined as the degree of host damage. Notice this conception is so different from Robert Cox, where the pathogenicity of organisms was a specific characteristic of a single species or strain. 
Perhaps we should altogether get rid of the term pathogen because it is not a characteristic of an organism, but rather an assessment of the relationship between a community of organisms and the hosts that they have colonized. They exchange DNA with their hosts, and how they modulate the host immune system by such exchanges is an area now of intense interest. It is becoming increasingly clear that microorganisms in communities modulate the signaling network of their hosts, and that these manipulations are often advantageous for the host, or at least have as an outcome a kind of homeostasis. It appears likely that we even exchange genes with our bacterial guests using a mechanism similar to transduction. So the take-home lesson here is that our understanding of infection, disease, disease that matters, and pathogen could benefit by being rethought through and redefined in light of our improved understanding of how these communities actually function within our bodies. The fact is, we are chronically infected with microorganisms, and 99.99% of the time, these infections are beneficial, or at least not harmful for us. These concepts are very difficult for endodontists, who still believe that bacteria are clonal, or ones that are trapped in Koch's germ theory of disease, which really engenders a way of thinking about disease based on pathogen A always causes disease A. And it takes intellectual effort to get past our historical biases that come from this Cartesian straight line on a graph, linear reductionist model that so hinders our deeper understanding. Try looking at it using a mathematical analogy. Acute Cockian planktonic single organism disease is like addition. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Simple nonlinear biofilm disease, especially dormant or resting biofilm disease, is more like nonlinear algebra, where many variables cannot be calculated as just a series of simple continuous functions. In nature, it's worth noting that most natural processes are inherently nonlinear. One curious aspect of nonlinear systems is that they appear to the observer to be chaotic and unpredictable and give an appearance of random behavior, like why some cases work and others don't. But they are absolutely not random. Cancer susceptibility, the weather, earthquakes, where lightning strikes, who gets the flu and who doesn't, come to mind. They may seem random, but they are not. It's just that they are not nonlinear processes, just like chronic bacterial disease. So, okay, it's complicated. To paraphrase, to paraphrase Hyman Roth in The Godfather, sorry guys, this is the life we've chosen. Quit complaining and man up. So let's just learn to deal with our issues in a non-reductionist way by understanding that disease expression in chronic microbial disease can take on many forms and require more than one treatment strategy as we try to account for all the permutations in changing nonlinear variables in our patients and the microbes that colonize them. A non-reductionist way of thinking about this would be microorganisms A, B, C, and D, when within host Z with immune system X in environment of V, seems to be correlated with disease that matters, but other times is correlated with disease that doesn't matter. Which one depends on a multitude of factors, most of which are unknown or poorly understood? To my way of thinking, that is what a careful scientist would say, because it exposes for all to see all the things we don't know or understand and limits our confidence to things we actually do know. The germ theory of disease usually leads to a treatment strategy of, let's kill all the bugs we can. I'm not sure this is an appropriate strategy for us. We should be smarter than this. I suspect we will never find the silver bullet we all desire and we're going to do a lot of harm to patients in focusing only on killing all the bugs.